everyone, my name is Lewis Leonard and I'm an application engineer for Rival Medical. Today we're going to go through some brief fundamentals of electrical parameters, then electrical safety and how that applies to healthcare organisations before going on to some medical safety standards where we look at the terminology and within them standards we'll look at why the test processes are different for service and manufacturers. A little bit about ourselves at Rigel. We're part of Seawood Electronic Limited, manufacturing and development team based in the UK. We're offering a growing range of biomedical test and measurement solutions, including electrical safety analyzers, we've got electrosurgical analyzers, defib pacer analyzers, flow analyzers, infusion device analyzers, and also vital signs simulators. We have a global distribution and after sales network, We've got a USA office which is based in Tampa with the rival division headed up by Paul Fopel. So just quickly going on to electrical parameters first, uh, most if not all of you will be aware of these terms but first we'll briefly go over these um, basics. So voltage is the potential difference creating the pressure driving current around the circuit. Current is the flow of electric charge and resistance is what reduces that flow around the circuit. A quick common analogy, as shown on the, on, on the right, is by thinking of electricity uh, in a circuit as you would with water, um, with a reservoir and pipes. Uh, an increase in water pressure, or in this case, uh, an increase in reservoir volume, is analogous with an increase in voltage. Now imagine resistance as the diameter size of the pipe. Uh, the more you resist the water flow by constricting the size of that pipe, uh, the less current that's going to flow. And this relates to electricity. You increase resistance, you reduce the current flow. A few more important terms to understand in regards to electrical safety. Capacitance is the storage of electrical energy. AC currents will flow and DC currents will not flow. You've got ground or earth. The terms depend on the region really, um, this is, is zero volts, it's effectively an electron reservoir. Uh, we'll come on to this in the next few slides. Um, you've also got frequency which is measured most commonly in hertz. This is basically the number of cycles per second in an AC circuit. In electrical safety this is important because mains frequency closely matches that of electrical impulses in the body, um, such as muscles, nerves and the heart. And when I talk about mains frequency, uh, 60 or 50 hertz is what's accepted worldwide. Um, also, we notice we highlighted AC voltages, um, which are charge, build and discharge. That's highlighted because of the way um, capacitance flows um, in devices. We'll look at that um, in the next few slides as well. So electrocution, depending on the severity of electrocution, it can lead to loss of muscle control severe burns and death. Uh, these levels of severity depend on several factors. The level of current is highly applicable, but also where the shock occurs. Uh, and even the body type needs to be considered. So the rate of death from electrocution in the UK has been reducing year on year, thanks to improved safety testing standards. Uh, employers all over the world have a legal and moral duty of care to protect not just employees, um, but also the general public. This especially applies to healthcare organisations um, where you've got patients and visitors involved. Um, patients is something we really like to focus on in electrical safety uh, for these types of environments, which, we, which we'll come on to. When we talk about general safe, uh, electrical safety, you're talking about means of user protection. Um, but um, in healthcare organisations, you come into all uh, different types of um, protection of individuals. So healthcare environments and electrical safety. Well, electrical safety in all industries um, and environments is important. Um, however, in healthcare environments, it takes on even more of a hazard. Um, firstly, there is a substantial risk in healthcare environments due to direct patient contact with medical electrical equipment. You've got electrical uh, patient beds. You've got ECG connections. Um, pacemakers um, and this equipment 
could potentially be in contact permanently to the patient, you know, from when a patient arrives, um, even until the time they leave. Uh, unfortunately, the human body is an excellent conductor. There is a thin skin barrier, which provides some resistance to electrical current. Um, however, the human body is primarily composed of water, um, which gives it its conductance. Um, it's also composed of ions and minerals, also conductive. Another thing to note is that patients are often in poor health, which increases the risk of death by electrocution. And they may, may also be anaesthetized and or unconscious, which would make them unaware of an electric shock occurring. Uh, so they could receive a sustained, relatively low current shock, but that could still be potentially lethal. Um, so in normal circumstances, a person can either let go, if they're aware of it, they can feel it, um, or even if it is above the let go current threshold, they'll at least be able to notify someone of it occurring, or someone may be more aware of it occurring. Um, a, cru a crucial factor in healthcare environments when considering electrical safety is applied parts. We look at this quite a lot in medical safety. Um, so patient connections can be placed in close proximity to the heart or the myocardial tissue. And the cardiac muscles are very sensitive to tiny currents um, because the heart, uh, as well as all muscles in the body, are controlled by very small um, electrical signals. Now with the heart, the signals begin in the SA node, there's a delay in the signal and then it's sent to the AV node before it's then passed on to the ventricles. Um, now the timing is crucial for this um, in the QRS complex as it's known. Um, so any electrical signals can affect the timing and that throws the heart off. The heart, um, it confuses the heart, the heart begins to quiver randomly um, and this is what we call ventricular fibrillation. Um, now, as you can imagine, very low levels of uh, electrical shock can induce, induce this. Um, this is known as micro shock, which we'll come on to shortly. Um, firstly, actually, we're going to have a look at uh, macro shock. So, this is where an electrical current passes through the body um, when contact is made between skin and an electrical source. Now it's non-invasive and the contact source is not in close proximity with the heart. Um, in most cases it's not. So this table is from a study that shows the physiological effects of electric shock by varying the current levels. Most importantly, if we're looking at the table, um, ventricular fibr fibrillation induction occurs at around 100 milliamps um, at 60 hertz, sort of the mo commercial frequencies of 60 or 50 hertz um, and if we look at 60 hertz we can see that the body is much more sensitive um, around this range dc it's much lower um, ventricular fibrillation is 500 milliamps for both men and women um, it wasn't even recorded on the 10 kilohertz scale um, so this is why it's important to understand that these low frequencies are hazardous um, to humans so the reason for this really is that as frequency increases, um, electrical current penetrates the tissue less and less. So at high frequencies, energy is dissipated in the form of um, tissue burning rather than uh, propagating through the body to the cardiac muscles. Um, anyone that understands about diathermies or biomeds um, is probably listening. Um, this is why diathermies do not induce electrical shock because they have very high frequency outputs. Um, so also another factor actually to consider with electric shock and frequency is that nerves and cells in the body are more responsive to um, commercial frequencies, not just the way they propagate, but also their, the way they respond to these frequencies, um, which makes the currents more hazardous. So we're going to come on to micro shock. Um, so in medical environments, we need to consider this more. Um, we need to remember is that skin, um, the skin, thin skin barrier and fatty tissue have a relatively high resistance to electricity. Um, and this can sometimes protect an individual from electric shock because what the higher resistance does is it dissipates energy into temperature and coagulation. 
I start in um, electro surgery. And this is what provides the basic protection to electrocution from macro shock. So nerves and blood cells, however, within the body, as I spoke about before, have relatively low resistance, um, which conducts a current easily through to the heart. Now, if you think about intracardiac, intracardiac connections, and we've got the bottom here, pacemakers and saline catheters, um, these are in close proximity to the heart, which means that low currents can really easily induce um, cardiac arrest. So as low as 20 microamps, um, so we're looking at 100 milliamps of ventricular fibrillation on this table um, for macro shock. For micro shock, we're looking at somewhere in the region of 20 microamps, or as low as 20 microamps. Um, so that's um, what was that for? It's 5,000 times less current. Um, so that that's that's the difference we're talking about with in terms of um, the difference between the levels of current. Um, you know, 100 microamps is a thousand times less than 100 milliamps. So we're going even less than 100 microamps. Um, so, okay, I've spoken about some of these factors already, but here is a graph showing the frequency response of the body to electric shock. Um, you can see as frequencies exceed 100 hertz, uh, the body becomes less stimulated exponentially. There is also the total impedance of the body here, which these are reflective um, in the electrical safety standards um, for the body model of the measuring devices. So you'll see this why this the, res the, res the impedance sorry of the body is important. We'll talk about resistance and impedance. Um, they're fairly similar terms, but impedance is related also to the uh, reactance to frequency. Which is why um, a measuring device isn't just a uh, resistor. Um, so here it is. We're talking about the uh, the body model in IEC 60601. The measuring device circuit of an electrical safety tester is designed to simulate the impedance, or shall we say, the electrical characteristics of the human body. Um, so we've got the electrical characteristics, the frequency characteristics. Um, with the relative magnitude. So what are the measures to increase safety? Well, earth connections first, touchable conductive metallic parts. Um, they provide an alternative path to current flow rather than through a person. Um, due to earth connections having very low resistances, um, which means that any hazardous currents will uh, almost we sometimes say that the, the current will just flow through the earth path entirely, but that's not entirely correct. Um, most, if not um, almost all of the current will flow down the earth path because it's, um, we think about a divider circuit, um, the resistance of a body is high, the resistance of an earth bond is very low. So that means most of the current will flow through that. I'll come on to this a bit more in a bit. Um, so we've got insulation. This is basic, which provides um, dialect, dialectic strength. This is the, which is the insulating material's ability to withstand the um, required voltage without breaking down. You've also got some supplementary um, insulation. This is an added layer to protect against electrocution. It's found in class two devices. It's also known as uh, double insulation. We've also got current breakers. So these detect excess current and switch off to prevent any circuit overload. We've got fuses. Uh, most people know what these do. These provide burnout after a certain uh, current levels um, are exceeded. They provide some sort of overcurrent protection. And then we've got electrical safety testing. Now these are performed um, to ensure that an electrical device is functioning safely and will continue to protect individuals in case of any uh, adverse events or failure conditions. So why do we need safety testing? Okay, we test for breakdown or damage to confirm the uh, medical equipment is electrically safe to use in a healthcare environment. And we 
we've gone over the risks we've gone over the risks associated with micro shock and macro shock. So you've got um, safety testing, which ensures protection um, against these risks. Um, you've got legal liability. And I spoke a lot about why healthcare environments are particularly hazardous. Um, well, legal liability is important in regards to protecting patients, staff, and visitors. Just one serious legal case can have a significant effect on a hospital's reputation. Um, so you've got safety testing is required at various stages of every product life cycle. First, when new equipment is acquired, when it's put into acceptance, um, and then also during regular intervals. These are known as P PMs or PPMs, preventative preventative plan, preventative maintenance. So any biomens, you'll understand that. And finally, any post repair, of course, putting back into circulation. So what tests are involved in medical electrical safety? Um, so the first one I want to really look at is earth bonding. These tests are included in all types of electrical uh, class one device testing. Um, not just medical, this is general electrical safety. This is all class one devices go through um, some sort of earth bond test. So the protective earth provides current path for in case of any leakage and fault currents. If we take a look at the circuit, the protective earth or PE is connected to the enclosure. Any leakage currents will flow down this path rather than through an individual in contact with the enclosure. Some current may flow for a person, but there is such a substantial difference in the resistance I've spoke about before that leakage would predominantly flow down the earth. And I'm repeating myself a little bit there. Um, so following that, we know that low resistance values are ideal. The lower the better. Um, so what this test basically does is measures the total resistance between the enclosure and PE, the protective earth. And this ensures that resistance values are low. Um, the limits vary from standard to standard. Um, and this is what gives a, quite a primary form of protection for class 1 devices. Um, you've got to remember that the enclosure is not insulated. It's not double insulated like class 2. So that's important. Uh, another thing as well, we're talk, looking at the bottom, we've got fault currents, which might trip the fuse. Um, that's another important factor. Um, so what that does is then the circuit is switched off in case any hazards occur. So earth bonding provides that sort of protection. We've got insulation tests. Now this isn't a mandatory part of testing in the universally accepted standards. Um, live neutral at the power supply of the device is shorted and equipment doesn't power up. Um, 500 volt DC is then applied across the power supply to the enclosure. Um, so we're looking here to measure a higher resistance, a higher, resi higher the resistance the better. Because this ensures that there is a great deal uh, of isolation between the, main, the mains input and the casing. So leakage testing and leakage current. Um, there's a lot of different types of current, so there's a lot to talk about. Well, firstly, uh, leakage current is any current that is non-functional, as stated in IEC 60601. So basically, it's any stray current that is not intended um, for the device, non-intentional. Yeah, non-intentional current is another word to use. So these currents are un unavoidable as it's the result of strain capacitive and resistive dielectrics. Equipment is designed to limit levels of leakage current, but even the best uh, insulated pieces of equipment will allow some sort of current to flow. Um, the currents are usually small enough to cause no concern, um, thanks to strict design criteria in IEC 60601. Um, regular testing, however, is required as equipment may not be performing um, as it should be. So we've got stray capacitance. Um, I spoke briefly in the slide of why capacitance is important in electrical safety, and this is why. Um, it shows how current flows to the enclosure. So why do we have conduct why do we have capacitance? Um, why is it unavoidable? Well, two conductive surfaces um, you've got there with different electric potentials. Um, 
So you're talking about the enclosure, will have a different electrical potential to um, parts within the device. Um, and then you've got insulators in between, which could even just be air. Um, they, these will all act as a capacitor in some form. Um, so there'll always, there'll always be some sort of current flow between components in the enclosures. Um, this is why stray capacitance is um, quite a significant consideration for PCB design because of all the components in close proximity. Um, the same thing here. But with here, you know, also we've, we've got, um, if we look over to the right, we've got uh, applied parts. Um, and we know about the effects of mi micro shock. So here you've got a significant de degree of isolation um, from the power supply, the main power supply. Um, so this is basically incorporated in the device to um, help prevent patient um, electric shock, usually by means of um, electro optic uh, electro optical isolators, um, known as opto isolators. systems. So terra neutral um, systems, you've got a non terra neutral systems are something to be considered with electrical safety testing as it affects leakage measurements. Uh, this means that neutral and protective earth are common in a TN system. This is important because lied to earth now has a highest potential. Um, this is actually from the next slide. Yep, so um, IEC 60601 uh, specifies configuration of the means during electrical safety for the mains. Oh, that was mean. During electrical safety tests as a terra neutral system, where neutral has the potential um, which is the same as ground. Uh, now, 230 volt live to a earth on a new, to a terra neutral system means there is a high potential between live and ground. Now here is a leakage measurement on a non-TN system, um, an IT system. There is a lower potential between live and earth. And with a lower potential, there will be a significant reduction in the level of le leakage level readings. Um, now it's important that the highest possible leakage measurements are, are measured. Um, this would be a fail. Um, but this would be a pass. Well, this could potentially be a fail. This could potentially be a pass. Um, you're looking. You really want to test it to um, its highest possible reading. Um, so we talk about the secondary earth path. Um, it's a common problem. It can often be overlooked during safety le testing leakages. Um, Medical equipment is often connected to other equipment such as monitors, data lines, um, which are also grounded to earth. This provides a second low resistance earth path. We know that leakage uh, current will mostly flow down the path of least resistance. This means that such a very uh, small percentage of leakage current will go through the analyzer. So much so that any leakage measurement readings will be displayed so much so that there might not be any leakage measurements displayed, um, potentially passing hazardous equipment. Um, if you remember that the um, devices, the medical safety devices, is the body model, it's based on the human body, and the earth is developed really to um, take away the current, the most amount of current. Um, this is a good example. Um, of how current flows more easily down an earth path. I've spoke about it, but this gives you a, a real good um, description of it. Um, how current will flow in a circuit. So the measurement device is a one kilo ohm um, body model. And the path to secondary earth is only one ohm, roughly one ohm. Um, these are just arbitrary values. Um, could be less than this, could be more, um, but generally you're going to be looking at a much, um, much more current flowing down the earth path. Um, 
So we know that um, not so much no leakage measurement might lead to Davis um, purely because of this reason. Um, so if, if I was to go back to the water analogy, imagine you've got two pipes from your reservoir now, and one pipe, this pipe, sorry, this pipe is now a thousand times um, greater in diameter than this pipe. All the water will flow down here. Um, well, most of the water will flow down here. So this is also what makes earth bonding, when I was talking about earth bond and the human body, how the situation is ideal. Protective earth performs by redirecting this potentially hazardous current um, away from a one kilo ohm human resistance to grounding. Gives you, um, so we move on to input protection classification. We have uh, means of operator protection, MOOC, and means of patient protection, MOC. Um, in means of operator protection, we have class one and class two classification. Class one medical equipment relies on the protective earth, and class two relies on supplementary insulation. This is also known as double insulation, um, which is actually what this symbol re represents. It gives you a um, good practical example. Um, so we also got output protection classification. So means of patient protection, there are different applied parts classifications depending on the type of patient contact. Type B applied parts are non-invasive, they're typically non-conductive and earth referenced. Uh, a good example is a hospital bed. Um, type BF is also non-invasive but designed to have direct conductive current with the patient, um, such as defibrillator panels and SpO2 probes. Now type CF is the most stringent classification. It connections close to the cardiac muscles, such as ECG leads and infusion devices. Um, if we think about microshock with extremely low levels of current that can induce cardiac arrest, that's why it's so stringent. Um, so basically, to summarize, B has little or no electrical contact. BF has electrical contact. This is how I think of it. And CF um, has electrical contact close to the heart. Also worth mentioning is the paddle symbols in each type. Um, over here, you've got these paddles to the left and right of the um, symbols. These symbols mean the applied parts are defibrillator proof. Um, so those are the that go through all the six symbols that we can have for patient protection. So we've also got medical device labels. Medical devices will have these to indicate which class and applied part classification. And that's usually when you're doing safety tests. The one on the left has the CF um, classification, um, which is also defibrillator proof. Um, we've got the we've got the equipotential symbol here. Um, this signifies that it's a class one device. And we've got the image on the right. So the box in the box is the double insulation. And above, um, we've got the symbol that shows us BF um, for applied parts. Um, sometimes you'll have two types of applied part classification, such as on defibrillators, which will have multiple types of applied parts. Um, E.g., you've got, you know, SpO2 probes, um, ECG leads, and paddles. Um, so, but anyway, the classification will be stated by the applied part connection interface. If you ever look down the side of a defibrillator, you'll see that it has all the different applied part classifications. Same with uh, patient monitors. You'll have a whole um, list of what classifications they are if you look on them. So medical devices and safety testing. Um, so firstly, what stand do we use? Um, we've got the visual tests, checking the connections, see if anything's damaged. We've got class one or class two classification, class three as well. Um, there's connections, um, exposed metal work, applied parts, also what type of classification. Um, then we've got standards and codes. Well, firstly, what is the difference between a code and a standard? A standard is a document containing uh, technical definitions, procedures, guidance for manufacturers, installers, and equipment users. It contains mandatory requirements, but compliance can be voluntary. 
a code is a document that's been enacted into law by local, regional or national authorities having jurisdiction there um, so that an engineer or contractor is actually legally obliged to comply um, by law. Um, it contains mandatory requirements. Um, so adhering to standards is best practiced uh, and it's also integral for good quality management systems. Um, this table is important when understanding medical safety testing standards. The IEC 60601 is an internationally recognised type test standard and has historically been used in biomedical departments. Um, what you've got to remember is IEC 60601 um, was developed for manufacturers during design and post assembly testing. It's a rigorous testing process, it can be destructive in recurrent testing. That's why we try to push for 62353. Um, and 62353 has been developed as an alternative to 60601 for biomeds or service engineers who want to carry out re recurrent and after repair testing as well as acceptance testing. So 62353 is effectively a user testing standard um, for when products are in service. Um, the codes in the second and third column, these are the nationalised codes um, for electrical safety which people have to follow. If we look at the each row there, the equivalent tests IEC 601 are displayed. So with the national codes, they differ, but you'll find that the codes are often derived from their testing procedures. Um, so they use they use testing procedures that are found in IEC 60601, and quite often you'll find it referenced. Um, that's quite that's the case for AS NZ 3551. You'll find that it's been referenced. Uh, now, if we look at the test for IEC 62353, however, the method of testing is different. So really, I'm going to focus primarily on the two international recognised standards and how these tests vary. But I'll also go over some of NFPA 99 and um, the other codes, and we'll also have a look at 61010. Um, so we've got IEC 60601. I'll talk about this first and then how 62353 compares and why we should be implementing it um, into service. So it's a mandatory design and test type standard for electrical, mechanical safety and compliance of medical electrical equipment. It ensures patient safety. If remember our MOPs, um, we've got user safety, which is our MOOPs, and just general safety in the environment. It was first published in 1977 but we're a few revisions in now, and these revisions take place quite regularly. Um, there's also been a couple of additions since 1977. So we've got fault conditions in IC60601. Uh, we've got open earth, um, reverse main supply. Um, we talk about neutral open, apply the mains to applied parts and mains on signal input or output. Always first we've got the earth bond test and then we've got leakage tests um, with no fault conditions and then we look at ones with single fault conditions. Earth leakage which measures current down the earth path. We've got enclosure leakage which measures leakage current of the device enclosure and we've got a patient AC and DC leakage, the leakage between applied parts and earth got patient auxiliary, which is the leakage between applied parts, and patient F-type, whereby uh, mains is applied to applied parts. So this is only from class one equipment, an earth bond test. Um, class two doesn't have an earth, so it's the form of protection, is the double enclosure. There's two different limits, one excluding the power cord. So for example, detachable cords, um, you've got 200 milliohms, which include a power cord. Um, so equipment with fixed power cords. Resistance is measured between equipment under test, earth, and exposed conductive parts of the enclosure. We've got earth leakage. This is the leakage current flowing down the earth wire in the mains lead. Uh, the body model measurement circuit is included at the bottom, um, just where it's highlighted in blue. Actually, anything that's highlighted in blue um, is the circuit of the analyzer or the safety tester. So what earth leakage is doing is looking at how much non-functional current is flowing down the earth path from the device. It's class one only with type B, BF and CF. 
bulk conditions include normal supply, normal supply with open neutral, reverse supply, um, supply with neutral reversed. We've got then we've got reverse supply with neutral open. The limits according to the third edition are 5 milliamp and 10 milliamp. And that reflects the study where we were looking at before of the effects of electric shock, um, macro shock. So if we go back to those limits, you'll find that the 5 and 10 milliamps um, fall between the, uh, I think they fall between the threshold of perception and the ability um, to voluntarily let go. And we talk about enclosure leakage, which is the leakage current flowing from the enclosure of the equipment to earth ground. It's class one, class two, B, B, F, C, F. We've got um, the same fault conditions apart from the normal supply open earth and reverse supply open earth. And for the limits, we've got 0 0.1 milliamps and 0 0.5 milliamps. Then we talk about patient leakage test. Um, so this is a leak flowing from any applied part to earth ground, class one and class two, B, B, F, C, F. Normal supply, and again, just the single fault conditions found in class one. Um, AC and DC current readings were taken. Now we talk about B and BF connections, which are tested by shorting all the patient leads together on patient leakage test. CF um, patient connections are measured separately. The limits as well we're looking at is because CF patient connections have higher degrees of classification. So um, the, the, there's obviously very different um, levels of limits, which again correlate to the effects of micro shocked patients. So um, this is why B or BF have higher leakage limits due to CF applied parts having that direct cardiac application. We've got patient auxiliary leakage. It's identical to patient leakage, except that leakage is measured between applied parts rather than between applied parts on earth. Same single fault conditions again. Um, so each individual patient connection is tested to all other patient connections combined. As you can imagine, this is quite a long duration of a set of tests when you consider all the fault conditions. Um, I'll talk about this um, when we talk about 62353 and how it's time saving. So we've got patient F-type leakage. This applies to 110%. This, uh, sorry, it applies 110% of an isolated mains voltage to applied parts. It's class one and two BF and CF only. And there's a current limit in resistor to five milliamps for safety reasons. And there's a oh, that's an RMS reading, taking like an average reading. Um, patient F-type. So for BF. All patient connections are shorted together within the applied part. For CF, all patients are measured separately again. So 601, 60601 leakage limits. These list all the fault conditions and leakage types. I won't go through all of this now. This is available in the standard. I don't want to bore people too much to death going through some leakage limits. Um, so IEC 62353. Um, so this is our recurrent test and test after repair of medical electrical equipment standard it was published in May 2007. Revision 2 was published in October 2014. Again, it has many revisions. It's well accepted and used in most of Europe by leading manufacturers and hospitals. It provides a quick and uncompromised test on the electrical safety of a medical device. It's part of a planned preventative maintenance procedure, a PPM or PM. Um, as well as uh, post repair and acceptance tests. So, what's involved in a PM or PPM? And what's a, a sequence of testing? So the, the objective first is to prevent or find potential faults. With medical equipment, it's often used in high stress, high workload environments. So, these regular testing periods are very important. Firstly, a visual inspection. Check the mains lead, any cracks in the device. Um, with most medical devices, you're thinking as well about hygiene. Um, that's why cracking can be important, not only for protect protection from the enclosure, but also for pure hygiene reasons. You don't want um, you don't want any fluids, 
entering those cracks is very hard to clean. Uh, it's very unhygienic. Um, then also you've got your safety tests. You've got earth bond, leakage and insulation. Then there's also testing the performance of the device. So if we think about a uh, defibrillator analyzer, um, we might be measuring the charge time, you know, the defib output, um, and also the pacer outputs. This is just to ensure everything is well within specification. And then we've got reporting and analysis, which leads to prevention of problems um, further down the line, which you might find. So a visual test in 62353, check the housing, which includes decontamination, We've got electrical connections, um, so your power supply, applied parts, etc. We ensure that it has the correct fuse for its rating. We check safety markings and labelling. We check the integrity of mechanical parts. Um, it's general common sense which is involved in this test. Many biomeds and service engineers will pick this up as they're going along, and this will come with experience. Um, there's one thing important to note is that 70% of all faults are detected during a visual inspection. Uh, so certainly a test should never be overlooked. And we've got earthbound currents. Okay, so the big difference between 62353 and 60601 is the level of current. Um, we've got 25 amp until 60601, which is potentially destructive to cabling. We've got much lower current in 62353. Um, so in regards to our safety analyzers, our 288 and 62353, they use the 200 milliamp. Um, current circuit. Uh, this was important to us to make these testers portable and battery operated. Um, but we also have a high current zap circuit incorporated into our devices to cover us for IEC 60601. It gives us a, a high current peak. Okay, earth bomb parameters, at least 200 milliamp AC and DC into 500 milliohm. We've got reverse polarity for DC, um, for instance, 200, minus 200 milliamp. It's maximum limited to 24 volt open circuit. The test is um, the test limit for 62353 is 300 milliohm, and a maximum test current of one amp is suggested. Our 6235 leakage test. There's equipment leakage, input safety, our means of operating protection, or and then we've got our user protection. Um, so there's applied part leakage. So this is our output safety, our means of patient protection. There's three different methods, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, patient connections are common or shorted together during testing. And then the total leakage of device is measured. So if you find a failure, uh, failure is detected and it shows up on the tester. Then after that, the engineer can go back and try out each patient connection separately. Uh, this is much more time saving. 90% um, of the cases, it's going to pass the, the safety test. Um, so it's much quicker to just do an overall leakage uh, measurement, which is what part of 62353 allows for. So our means of operator protection is equipment leakage testing. It's the total sum of leakage deriving from the incoming mains to earth via the APs and enclosure with an open earth single fault condition. It's class one and class two and all applied parts classifications. Um, as mentioned before, all patient connections shorted. It's the RMS value, so the average value of the AC current. Um, let me talk about total leakage of patient connections to earth, non-conductive parts on the enclosure, fault condition with mains on applied parts, uh, three and a half milliamp limited resistor, Mains frequency, so there's a current limiting resistor in the circuit. It's floating type and BF and CF, so no B type. Got class one and class two. Patient connections are grouped together by their single function and excluded APs left floating. Um, so we have three different methods for 62353. This is to overcome in service problems um, such as devices on. Uh, non terra neutral systems and the permanent secondary earth path. Um, so it's important to understand that whilst it's ideal to test equipment um, in laboratory conditions, we understand that this isn't always the case. Um, so, you know, there's many movable or fixed devices in hospitals, such as ultrasounds, machines, MRI scanners, 
Um, so we know that the laboratory settings can't always be provided. Um, so this table basically shows us how can we carry out leakage tests um, under specific conditions. Um, so if we look at here, we've got the process, choose the right method. And so if we select yes for both options, we go to direct method. Um, in most cases, this will, this will happen. We want to pick direct method because it's the most accurate. Um, so if you come across devices, you really want to be testing to direct if you can. Um, the other methods give you alternatives if it's not possible. So the direct method is actually the direct equivalent of leakage tests in IEC 60601. Um, and if you go find this, uh, if you go find this flowchart from the 6235 standard, you'll find that there's 60601 tests that come out of this part here. If you select yes and yes, you can then actually do 60601 leakage tests as well. Um, so I'll just talk about the 62353 leakage methods. The direct one is the true leakage to earth. Um, it measures AC and DC leakage current. It's the highest accuracy, so it should be prioritized. Um, things to take in consideration, ground interruption, secondary earth path and terra neutral systems. Um, also note there's a one kilo ohm body model measuring device within the safety tester. And then we've got differential method. So differential measurements, they look at the difference in current between the live and neutral conductors. Um, if we look at here, current travels in opposite directions. Um, as the current passes through the live wire in one direction, the current in the neutral wire travels in the opposite direction. Now with this, the current in the live wire carries both the functional current, so the actual draw of the current, but also the non-functional current, the leakage current. Um, whilst the current in the neutral wire only carries the functional current. So measurements then are worked out, and it's shown here, I phase minus neutral by, this is how they calculate the leakage. Um, so the problem with this, though, is that it's relatively inaccurate. Um, these are considerations. Especially if a device is drawing a lot of current, the leakage will be much harder to pick up. Um, and the principle of the differential leakage measurement is also based on induction, so it's quite susceptible to external magnetic fields. We've got alternative method, um, so it's similar to an insulation test or a dielectric, dielectric strength test, where live neutral are shorted together. It's current limited, isolated main potential frequency. Um, so a TN system or secondary earth plaths are not applicable. We have to consider that there's a current limit in resistor up to three and a half milliamp. Uh, measured leakage current is also scaled up, so the applied voltage is lower. This also means it's safer for testing if a um, suspected hazardous fault is present. It's only directly comparable with IEC 60601 um, open neutral. So here's our leakage limits from 62353. I won't go through these either. Um, these are also available in the standard. I will provide um, this presentation. It will be available to you guys if you wish to have a copy so you'll be able to take these limits. So why was 62353 introduced? Um, also, why is it beneficial? Why would you want to use 62353 over 60601? Well, 62353 was developed um, to, for its user testing, its routine testing. We think about a product life cycle. At the start of a product's life cycle during the design and type testing standard, IEC 60601 is the standard to use. The tests can be destructive, um, can potentially damage the equipment. So if we think about type testing um, in the car industry, um, you would do a type test on a car, test it to its uh, maximum safety. But then you've got routine testing, MOTs, you wouldn't be doing the same sort of destructive tests as you would in your type testing. And that's where 62353 comes in. Um, so it's, it's important for a sort of post-manufacturer, um, once it's out of the manufacturing phase and into recurrent testing. 
Um, it's also, so it overcomes a couple of other issues as well, which as well, is, you know, you talk about the different methods of testing, which overcome those um, inabilities to reproduce laboratory, laboratory testing conditions, as they're not very realistic. Um, and so we'll talk about IC62353 in the testing cycle. Um, so covers production, um, but it's not really applicable. So we already we really we look at acceptance, PMs, and post repair. People that are, have our safety testers, our rival to AR62353, they'll be using um, for these processes here mostly. We do have 60601 available in our testers, but um, we try to push for 62353. Um, we want that to be the accepted standard. It's the right way to go. It's the IEC recommendation for recurrent testing. Um, there's still a lot of people that use 60601 um, because it's always been historically used. Um, so it's moving away from that. So IEC 60601 versus 62353. Um, tests are related, but the procedures are different. Um, with leakage tests, you have the three different um, leakage methods, depending on the situation. Um, this gives you an idea as well of how much time is saved by using um, 62353. So although this is with 10 F-type applied parts, so really it's the maximum number of tests you could get using 60601. Um, but however, the, the time saving is substantial in any medical testing situation. Um, you've got 290 tests there and you've got four excluding earth bond that's the difference i mean even if you had a couple of applied parts you're still going to get quite a number of tests for 60601 in comparison very quick um, and it's done that simply by grouping leakages together there's no need to measure all the leakages individually if um, you're, if you're already measuring the total leakage um, so another thing to know actually we've we talked about codes earlier nfpa 99 um, although they don't have the same tests, they do follow a similar principle of 62353 and that the tests are uh, condensed down. You, you've got combined applied parts for leakage. I'll talk a little bit about NFPA 99 as well, how it works. Um, so it's a similar process in that it's time saving. Firstly, I'll talk about IEC 61010. Um, safety requirements for medical for electrical equipment for measurement control and laboratory use not medical equipment the definition of a medical device is electrical equipment designed for treatment monitoring or diagnoses of patients powered from not more than one connection to main supply and which are necessarily in physical or electrical contact with the patient or transfers energy to or from the patient or detects such energy transfer to or from the patient this is from the 61010 standard. So it describes testing requirements during design and production line. Um, so it does production line testing, earth bond and high pot testing. Uh, so there's no maintenance or annual testing described in this standard. Um, however, if in doubt, contact the manufacturer of the equipment under test. Um, so leakage measurements are only required if the measured touch voltage is greater than 33 volts. Um, however, touch current is ultimate safety indicator. In Europe and USA, um, standard PAT testers are used or medical safety testers using um, either 62353 um, touch leakage, um, 60601 enclosure leakage, and a use of a more sensitive body model is also allowed. It should be noted from this that results from this method need to be extrapolated e.g. touch current of 100 microamps um, is equal to 100 millivolts of touch voltage. So there's four different types of body models based on the environment. We've got basic frequency response, um, less sensitive than the med uh, medical body model. It's 2k ohm body model as opposed to the, the 1k ohm you'll find in the other standards. Um, so it's not as applicable for us in the uh, medical testing field. So we don't concentrate on that one as much. Um, NFPA 99 is important. This is law in the USA. Um, 
or law at least in many states. So as I say, it's common in USA hospitals. Um, it's the law. Class two equipment is only a visual inspection. The, the standard states that class two uh, with a double enclosure is adequately safe. You've got no um, paint applied part classification references. There's no difference between the applied parts. They're all the same. Um, they're all classified as the same. There's iterations since 2005. Each patient lead to ground. Um, isolation test, mains on applied part. It's got lead to lead, floating and non-floating. Uh, chassis name change to touch leakage. Also remove ground connections, which was optional in 2015. So some of the definitions was fixed equipment. Equipment which is permanently wired. So we're talking about your um, in hospitals, you're talking about MRI machines, equipment like that. Um, so with this, it's patient care vicinity. So it's tested during installation um, and there's ground leakage, current limit of 10 milliamps. And you also got portable equipment. So this is electrically powered equipment that can be moved from location to location. The majority of equipment you're going to find um, in the hospital. This is the body model, follows a similar frequency response to the other um, body models, um, such as in IEC 60601. It reflects that lower, um, you know, the higher magnitude or the lower frequencies. Um, and again, it was a very similar body model. Now, ground bond is only on class one equipment, it's 500 milliohm limit. Um, again, measured between equipment under test, earth and exposed conductive parts of the enclosure. Similar process. So touch leakage is the leakage current flowing from the enclosure or equipment to ground. So we're talking about enclosure leakage uh, is equivalent. Power switch on and off, um, you use both. Um, ground closed is 100 microamps, ground open is 500 microamps. Um, so again, this is a similar schematic to what we find in um, the 60601 and 62353 standards. We don't have to measure in circuit, you have a current meter here. Um, so it's read slightly different, um, but it's a similar process. So you've got lead to ground, lead leakage is the leakage flowing from any applied part to ground. In other standards, it's called patient, um, or you've got patient connection or patient leakage. They call it lead leakage in the US for NFPA 99. Um, so the applied parts are connected together. Um, again, this is time saving. Power switch on and off, you've got ground closed 100 microamps and ground open 500 microamps again. And again, here's the limits. Um, well, as I say, I'll provide these tables um, to anyone who's interested. And that wraps it up. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, please ask me in the chat box or the question box. Um, I think some of you already wrote some questions, so I'll try to answer them now.